in the power of Pentecost, we have to get ourselves in tune with what's going on between us and God. We know Zechariah said it not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. And I made the statement that we feel an urgency in the body of Christ that it's time to bind together. I read an article from 1972 from a teacher that most of us know. And his quote was, False teachers will approach the flock like vicious wolves. Even some of the brothers will destroy, it, dis- distort the truth to draw followers to themselves. Having looked out for them and shed many tears on behalf of them, Paul said, He is now entrusting these to God. And his uplifting message will save them and set them apart. But Paul is also warning them of the inevitable attacks from both outside the church and inside the church. The attacks are designed to draw away faithful biblical people from God. They will say twisted things. Many want to make the Holy Spirit their own personal toy. Does that make sense to you? That I want the Holy Spirit when I want the Holy Spirit, when I don't want the Holy Spirit, then I don't want the Holy Spirit. And a lot of churches are the very same way. I shared with the pastor earlier a situation that happened to me earlier this week. And I told the brother, I said, you need to read your word. Because what I say is not going to make any difference. You need to read your word. And we're talking about people who proclaim to be Pentecostal people who believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, but they're not following the power of the Holy Spirit. They're following whatever the mood is or whatever the mode is whatever's going on right now that's what I want that's what that's the way we want to go our moral culture is changing but the church cannot change with the culture of the times the church must be the church and the church must rejoice at the church a lot of churches and I'm not talking about Anything but Pentecostal churches because I don't know anything about other churches. I can't talk about them because they're not my church. I can talk about my church. It's my church. And I don't know if the pastor will agree with me or not, but there seems to be a drawing away from the Holy Spirit and a move of the Holy Spirit. And whenever I begin to think about that, it's kind of like... We just want to put the Holy Spirit in a box. Then when I want, I open my box and I pull out the Holy Spirit and wave Him around a little bit. And then I fold Him up and I put Him back in my box for another week. The next Sunday, if everything, the worship team really gets it going good, I'll pull Him back out. Come on, amen. But if I need Him during the week... I can't find him because I lose my box. But that's not the way it works, people. If you remember what I told you, that we must walk the walk and talk the talk. We can't be God-fearing, Pentecostals, Christ-believing on Sunday and live like the devil the rest of the week. Because be be assured of one thing, your sins will find you out. Judah had enjoyed successful military encounters. and Judah had enjoyed everything. They had military power. They had economic stability and social progress. But there was a lack of sensitivity to what God wanted. Sounds a lot like the USA today, doesn't it? 
the church will begin to disintegrate when it loses its identity. When we begin to realize the responsibility of showing God and the beauty of His character and the saving power to all of mankind and all of this rest upon the church. And I read somebody on Facebook the other day that said, we the church need to bind together to pray for the USA because one person cannot do it. I agreed with the first part of that. We as the church do need to bind together. But listen to me. Go to your Word and you'll find several times where one person stood in the gap for the nation. David stood in the gap. Moses stood in the gap. Nehemiah stood in the gap. Amen? And, and on and on and on we find where people would stand in the gap for the church. Well, preacher, it's too big today for one person to stand in the gap. We're not talking about one person. We're talking about one person, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit standing in the gap. And whenever we come to the place to realize that we as a church must disclose Jesus clearly, if we're to lead others to Christ, we first must be Christ-like. I can't live like the world lives and expect to win people to Christ. A deep trust in God excites activity and desire to draw closer to God. Isaiah, the son of Amos, had thrust upon him the antiquated influences of his time. The people were not living in the will of God. And I could, I could ask you, and you could say, I know some people who claim to be born again, but are not living in the will of God. They're not acting the way God people act. They're not acting the way Christians act. They're just going through the motions. But we need to stop and say, wait a minute. God still has a plan. Everybody who cries, Lord, Lord, is not of God. So a question that has bothered many for ages is why do willful people willfully destroy themselves and endure the effects of sin when all they have to do is call upon God? If our worship is just going through the motions without a purpose, if our worship is half-hearted and is dead and formal and hypocritical, maybe even nauseating to God, Turn with me if you have your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4. When you get there, say amen. amen. Verse 29, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace, Unto the hearers. Now I want you to listen to what I'm saying. I'm hearing more and more corrupt communication come from believers or people who claim to be believers than I've ever heard. <clears throat> this is not a good thing. And I'm not necessarily talking about cussing and carrying on, I'm talking about gossiping. If you want to kill the Spirit, get gossip going. Satan knows how to kill the Spirit. All he's got to do is get one person and start gossiping against another person. Hello? But listen to what he said. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Grieve not. So I asked the question, how do I grieve the Holy Spirit but not walking in the will of God? But not doing the will of God? By not obeying the will of God, I grieve the Holy Spirit. When He ministers to me or speaks to me to tell me to do something and I do not do it, it grieves the Holy Spirit for us not to walk according to what the Holy Spirit says. But then He said, let all bitterness. Boy, that's hard for some people. And all wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking mm. be put away from you with all malice. Get rid of these things. You know, if you're having a problem with these things, you know, get them under the blood. 
You know, if you can't do it alone, find somebody that will help you. Make your way to an altar of repentance and fall on your face and begin to weep and cry before God and let God begin to take care of these things. The Holy Spirit will cleanse you of these things. And be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. These verses clearly indicates that the aim of a true disciple in the kingdom of heaven should be a single, clear, defining motion. The service should be single. What does that mean? That means that my calling, my calling is directed to God. My calling is direct from God. My calling is to do what God has called upon me to do. My single focus is to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Amen? That's my single focus. My focus is to do what thus saith the Lord, not what thus saith J.P. And J.P.'s kind of hard-headed. And he has to get under himself under subjection all the time. And we don't need an amen from over here. But we look at Isaiah chapter 1. In verse 11, if you want to read with me, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 11. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith saith the Lord? I am full of burnt offerings and rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of bullocks or of lambs or of he goats. When he come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hands to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations, incense, and an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with it, is iniquity, even the solemn meetings. And that's very plain what he is saying here. I'm tired of your coming and calling upon me with your vain worship. That's pretty clear, isn't it? You bring your sacrifices and they don't mean thing. They don't mean a thing. You do all of this and nothing means anything because all of it is vain. You don't mean it. You're just going through the motions. Just going through the motions. God said, it's time to stop going through the motions and begin to start worshiping. And He says, Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and then I will receive you and will be a father unto you, and you will be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Listen to what he said. Separate yourself. Separate yourself. I told you last time that we're servants of God and we must learn how to be servants of God. But Jesus said, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what his master does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything I hear from the Father, I will tell to you. So to go from being a servant to being a friend. Lord, teach me how to be a friend. Well, in order to be a friend, I have to know what thus saith the Lord. I have to know what God wants. I have to know what the intentions are. And when I begin to realize that I'm a friend to Jesus. I am a friend to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I have, through the blood, separated myself from the things of this world. And there may be many things be in the mind, but the secret is to see the Lord high and lifted up. We see the Lord. We, we know what the Lord wants. We understand what the Lord wants. And we continue to worship Him and continue to call upon Him. And I know this can get kind of heavy sometimes, but we need to come to realize God is looking for those who want to worship. God is looking for somebody who wants to lift holy hands to a holy God. You know, there comes a time we have to say, Lord, it's time for me to learn how to worship. 
which has nothing to do with your time period in, in a church. It has to do with your relationship to Jesus Christ. Amen. It don't matter what position you hold in the church. You could be the pastor and still not know how to worship. You could be a deacon and still not know how to worship. You could be somebody just born again and know how to worship. Amen. If you look at the world, and I know this is not a great comparison, but on one hand, but on the other hand it is, the world knows how to worship their gods. We need to learn how to worship our God. The world knows how. Chip, go ahead. Chip, go ahead. And we're going to lesson two, receiving the power of the Holy Spirit, and begin to realize, I need to know how and what to do with the power of Pentecost. And, I, and I'm afraid, I'm afraid. There's a lot of churches Losing the power of the Pentecost. I talked to a, a brother some time ago, not even in Kentucky, in another state. He said, I cannot tell you the last time we felt a move of the Holy Spirit in our church. And I said, brother, that's sad. That's sad. There should never come a meeting in a church where we do not feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. I don't care if it's a Monday. I don't care what day of the week. I don't care if it's Sunday. I don't care what day it is. We should feel the presence of the Holy Spirit in our midst. In Acts chapter 2, verse 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they began to speak the Word of God with boldness. So the question I ask is, have we lost our boldness? There comes a time in, in Luke chapter 11, Jesus changes the terminology from all to everyone. And Paul said it this, Peter said it this way, for this promise is unto you and to your children. And to them that are far off, and even as many as our Lord God shall call. So, listen to what he said. This promise is unto you, to your children, to them that are far off, as many as our Lord God shall call. So the question I'm asking you, how many are living and breathing the promises of the gifts that we have received from Jesus Christ? How many of us are actually living these promises? How many of us are living the place that He has called upon us to live and not just living on the sidelines and just waiting for somebody to get us excited on Sunday that we can go, yay, but living it 24-7. Amen? Amen? There should never be a time that somebody calls you for prayer that you're not ready to pray. I'm talking about spiritually pray. Any of us can pray. Even Satan knows how to pray. I'm talking about a spirit-filled, Holy Ghost-filled prayer. One that can touch God. Amen? Amen. You know. And the thing of it is, if you're the one needing prayer, you know if the person is praying, and they're praying with the power of God or praying not with the power of God. And Christ is letting us know that he uncovered God. He dispelled the darkness. And he came down and unveiled God and said, this is the way God is. Because they had their ideas of God. God was way up there and we're way down here and we do something wrong. He's just going to strike us. But God said, no, he, or Jesus said, He's a loving God. I and my Father are one. He that's seen me has seen the Father. Then he said, right, we can experience the love of the Father. Have you received and experienced the love of the Father? Sure you have. You're born again. You've experienced that love. Even if you're not born again, you've experienced the love of God. Are you still with me? Yep. Jesus also revealed that we could experience this love. We need not withdraw in trembling fear from God, but boldly come before the throne of God. No longer mysterious. No longer way out yonder somewhere. 
But if you've seen me, Jesus said, you've seen God. Because 1 Timothy 3, 16 says, God was manifest, manifest in the flesh and God came down from heaven tabernacle with man and was a man among men we have seen and felt and handled the word capital W-O-R-D of life so when is the last time you've handled the word of life when is the last time you felt the presence of God when is the last time you've been touched by the Holy Spirit there should not a day go by that you're not touched by the Holy Spirit some way somehow But then we need to listen. Then the power and the fire of Pentecost came. There is not a person in this room tonight or anywhere else that has received all that God has for them. I want to repeat that because I I don't know if that's in your notes or not. There is not a person here who has received all that God has for you. Too many of us are living beneath our opportunities and our privileges. God has far more than we're wanting to receive. I hope I'm making myself very plain tonight because we need this. We need to understand this. We're living beneath our opportunities. I think about this and I think about the reports that I get and I'm sure Pastor David gets them also of people being raised from the dead in other countries. Why aren't we seeing, why aren't we seeing people raised from the dead? Cancer's falling off of people. All kind of stuff taking place in other parts of the world. And one, one, preacher, one preacher put it this way. He said, because they haven't realized in these, other, these, new, these countries where they're new to Christianity, they haven't realized there's things God can't do yet. I thought, that's true. That's true. Because so many times we come in wanting nothing, expecting nothing, getting nothing, and leaving with nothing. And it's not the pastor's fault. It's not the worship team's fault. It's not the person next to you's fault. It's my fault. It's your fault. I receive. If I want it, I'll receive it. Amen. But you see, a lot of us lot, lot just don't want it. It's just, you know... Pastor, if you go past 12, that's tough. I have a condition. Come on. Amen. But yet, I can watch a ball game for hours and not have any problem. And so many are saying, I'm going to shake hands with a pastor, get baptized, go home and content, and give it no more thought. Even some who have went on and experienced the infilling of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues have decided, I don't want to go any further than I've went because something may be required of me. There will be something required of you. You'll be required to live holy. You'll be required to worship. You'll be required to give back to God what God has given to you. You'll be required to go out and win lost souls to the kingdom of heaven. And I ask the question, when is the last time you won a lost soul to the kingdom of heaven? That was kind of a pointed question. But I would dare you and I would challenge you rather to, Lord, lead me by somebody that I can lead to Christ. But be careful. If you ask that, he's going to do it. I think I shared with you that he told me to go across the street to my neighbor And witness to him. And I know my neighbor. He's a rascal. He sits in his garage. Drinking beer and eating by any sausage. That guy's got a big problem. 
And so finally I just walked across the street and sat down in his garage with him and We talked a little bit. I said, Bruce, what about Christ? And this is what he did. And he never turned back around to look at me. <laughs> I said, Bruce, Jesus loves you. And he, uh, but what I got out of that was, Kip, I hit a sore spot. I hit something, or I didn't hit it, but the Holy Spirit hit something. But I am very serious, since that day, that garage door hadn't been opened again. And I know He's waiting for me to come back. But what are you saying? I am saying that we're living beneath the opportunities that Christ has given to us. It takes more than shaking hands with a pastor. It takes more than just getting baptized. It takes more than just going through the motion. It takes more than when the worship team's up clapping your hands and saying amen. We have to develop our Christian experience. And in order to do that, so the question I'll ask you is, have you been touched by the fire? He said, you shall be filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. He didn't say you was going to go warm yourself at the fire. Amen? I remember the old days where the pot belly stoves and people would come in and they'd do like this. Then they'd turn around and do like this. Then they'd do like this. And I was a guy that walked up when they stood up there too long and I'd pull their pants legs and then start dancing. Some of you don't understand that, but when you get too close, them, them britches' legs get real hot. And I knew they was in the Spirit because they'd go, woo, woo, woo. But it takes more than sh shaking hands. It takes more than just going through the motions. It takes more. And this is what he's trying to tell them. I want to develop, he said, your Christian experience. I want you to learn how to be a child of God. And I think sometimes when we get older, we push them things aside. Let the younger ones do it. But as long as I'm breathing air, I have to win somebody to Jesus Christ. Amen. Turn with me again to the book of Isaiah. And it was because of conviction, if you will, and confession that sprang into Isaiah's conscience that instigated the cherubim to wing his way with purifying fire. When you get there, say amen. Isaiah 6. Is on one of you with me tonight? <laughs> oh, I forgot you're using your phones instead of the printed word. Isaiah 6, verse 6. Then flew one of the cherubims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs with the tongs off of the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, and thy iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, or who will go for me? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see indeed, but perceive not. In other words, they thought they knew what was going on, but they did not know what was going on. Amen. But listen to what he said. A special angel came down. He didn't come down on his own. Angels never do things just because this seemed like the right thing to do. They do it because God has told them to do it. He didn't come with his own ability. The touch of the cherubim had no cleansing or healing virtue of its own. Neither did he give purchase, purpose to the to give the man spiritual, spiritual gifts. 
Now listen to it. Listen, if an angel could not perform this feat, let it be clearly understand that mortal man cannot do this. No person can give you spiritual gifts. No person can give you real peace. No person can give you real power. And it's never brought by strange fire. If it's brought by strange fire, fire, it doesn't last very long. The tongs were important. The hot stone was important. But Isaiah did not allow these two objects to captivate his spirituality. Listen to me. Instruments and technical things that we have nowadays have their place, but they cannot replace the fire. You know, we appreciate all the modern things that we've got going on. We could literally take this service. Pastor, I believe I'm wrong. You let me know that we could send it around the world with no problem. But that's not where the fire is. Worship team, you're tremendous. You've got the fire, but you can't give the fire. The tongs were important, but they weren't the fire. The angel was important, but the angel was not the giver of the fire. The stone was important, but it was not the giver of the fire. Are you with me? The instruments can never replace the fire. And we need to get our attention off of the mechanics and get our focus on God. And I know you've heard this and I've had it said, if we can just get the right evangelist to come. Well, I've had the right evangelist before. And I've had people say, well, if you do as good as he do, maybe better. I said, well, that's not the purpose. The point was that you wanted a great evangelist and I found one. And it's not, listen to me, it's not up to the evangelist. It's not up to the preacher. The preacher cannot come down and make you worship God. I've got to want to worship God. I've got to want to be separated. So what was the revelation that Isaiah realized? And he laid it upon my mouth. Tenderness. Not to hurt, but to heal. The cleansing edifice resided not in the the hot stone, but it resided in the divine fire. And Isaiah cries out, Here am I. Paul cried out this way, Be not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Then Isaiah said, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Listen, during all of this, the angel is there. Remember the angel? Hello. Go like this. I believe it was an angel, took a hot stone, took the thong, took a hot stone, But Isaiah, I heard the voice of the Lord. Sister Melissa, I've heard his voice before. And he did not have to be introduced. He didn't even have to introduce himself. I knew who he was. I heard the voice of the Lord. I said, Lord, I want to hear that voice again. And the voice said, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? I like that part right there. 
who will go for us. He didn't say me, he said us. And Isaiah said, whoop, yo. I go, here I am, send me. What, what is he saying? When you get touched by the Holy Ghost fire, here I am. I can slay dragons. I can pull down strongholds. I can leap a wall. I can run through a troop. I can do whatever you want me to do. Just send me. But too many say, don't send me past the door. This touch of the fire is not mystical. It's not mysterious. The Holy Ghost baptism is the birthright, listen to me, of every born again believer. This Holy Ghost baptism is not just for the Pentecost, it's for anyone who wants it. Come on, amen. It's our privilege to be touched by the Holy Ghost in fire, just as the apostles were. It's in, invigorating. The Samaritan believers were touched with fire in Acts 8. Gentiles who could not receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they were told, that they should not have even been Christians, the Gentiles. But some way Christ didn't get that memo. Paul didn't get that memo. Peter didn't get that memo. When the sheep was led down, and he was told while he was on the roof, rise and eat, I don't eat that stuff. Don't call what I touch unclean. Because whosoever will, let them come. Even the Gentiles were ignited with the Holy Ghost fire. They were astonished that it was poured out. But listen to me, you will not be touched by Holy Ghost fire against your will. If you don't want it, fine. We'll move on to somebody else. If you want to live in spiritual poverty, that is your decision. When there's abundant riches available to whomever let will, let them come. Notice a particular kind of man or woman for whom this voice is seeking in Isaiah. It is a person who must be sent. It is a person under an impulse. It is a person under authority. It is also a volunteer. It's also a person who rejoices in being obedient. And it's also a person who is willing to go. Sometimes the go is just right out the door. Sometimes it's across the street to see Bruce. Sometimes it's somebody else. So there's no excuse. There's no excuse for not being a witness. There's no excuse for lack of spirituality. There's no excuse, as we already read, for destructive criticism. I was asked just a few days ago about a, about a brother pastor. I said, I have nothing to say. Well, I think this, and I said, well, I don't want to hear what you've got to say. Because I don't think God is pleased when I'm going to stand there and listen to garbage. Now, if you've got a problem, take it to God in prayer. He may listen to you. Or He may take a live coal off of the fire and stick, your own, stick it on your lips. But the vision of God gives meaning to the voice of God, the loving Father, the voice of the bleeding Lamb, the voice of the blessed Holy Ghost. There's... One leap at this moment is freely offering himself. 
and let's learn to respond like Samuel. Here am I, for you did call for me. You called me, so here I am. And he's calling us, church. You see, I know, Pastor, I remember the promises he give on this give to this church. And his promises are yea and amen. When? Well, in his time. The problem is we're we're very impatient people. I believe you, God, you should have done it yesterday. But to freely offer ourselves, here am I, Lord. I just don't want to pull you out of a box when I need you. Then when I don't need you, I put you back in the box. I don't want to just, you know, just kind of walk around. But I want to walk in the Spirit. Because when I walk in the Spirit, I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. We need to cry, I'm your person. I'm your soldier. Put me in the lines. I'm your man. I'm your woman. I seek the fire. I seek to make a difference. I want to make a difference, don't you? I've got to make a difference. When Moses seen the Lord, he said, Make use of me. Make use of me as you will. How many of us have said, Lord, here I am, just use me. Use me up. When Peter saw the Lord, he said, Lord, I'm a simple man. I will serve you. Paul's vision ignited a fire that could not be quenched by multitudes of troubles. Paul suffered greatly because of who he was and what he'd done. Even from the church at that time. Paul couldn't be trusted, they said. Paul couldn't this and Paul couldn't do that. Paul, you can't go to the Gentiles. Well, I can. God sent me to the Gentiles and I could just hear Paul saying, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. And he went. When the cry of repentance is heard, the ears begin to open up from above. See, God has no pressed into service. Some people in the military are, go freely. They enlist. Some people are drafted or used to be. There's even some that judges make them join the military. But with God's service, you come willingly. You may wish later you had them done. If you don't, you may wish later you had them, but you must come willingly. God's service is all volunteer. It's all volunteer. Paul said, Woe is me if I preach not the gospel. And see, the thing of it is, you cannot be silent when the fire of the Holy Ghost begins to fall on you. You can't be silent. Anytime there's a fire, people know about it everywhere. Anytime something going on, I thought about the school shootings today. It was known within minutes. It was known across America. Probably across the world. If we could get so excited about serving God. If we could get so excited about winning lost souls. If we could just get enough fire in us to stir up somebody else. Because you can't fool people. If you don't have the goods, they know it. If you're on fire, they know it. And if you're not on fire, they know it. Especially those you live with. And those you live close to. They know whether you've got the goods or not. There's one little lady I talked to one time. 
You know, I said, what about, she was having a lot of trouble. And I said, what about your mom and dad? She said, preacher, if you knew what went on with, at my home, you wouldn't have asked me that question. Of course, everything was hoop to do at church. But let me tell you, behold, your sins will find you out. Amen? You can't live for God on Sunday and live for the devil the rest of the week. You're either on fire 24-7 or you're not on fire at all. So God wants us to come out. We can't be silent. Lord, I just pray for the Holy Ghost fire to fall on us. How many people does it take? Well, it took one Isaiah, took one Peter, took one Paul. Amen. Took one Nehemiah, took one David, took one Abraham. And the list goes on and on and on. All he says is I'm looking for somebody that wants to be on fire for God. I want to be on fire for God.